everyone, welcome to God's Plan, Your Part, Year 2, where this year we're reading through and studying the entire New Testament, one chapter at a time. Thanks again for joining us in discovering God's plan and your part in it. Today we are looking at 1 Timothy chapter 3. I would say this is a uh, chapter that I go to often uh, when I'm explaining what it means to be a leader of God's church. Uh, There are a lot of things that we think are required to be a leader of God's church that are not, and a lot of things that we um, expect of people who are leading God's church that are not real requirements. So I think this is a great chapter to look at. Um, I think it would be wonderful if we would require this of everyone who is uh, leading churches, but that is obviously not always the case. Mm -hmm. So once again, for me... I am much more black and white with these types of things, I think, at least in my preferences anyway. And I love passages like these because it feels like things are laid out very explicitly for us. Uh, It doesn't leave you scratching your head thinking, well, what about this? Does it actually mean that? Or like this is direction of what God's church is supposed to look like, how it's supposed to function, how it's supposed Uh to operate. And for me, that is just so freeing i mean as as much as it's like qualifications list it's like oh well it makes sense for this person to be in this role because of the things that it Mm -hmm. says in the in god's word so i appreciate it it is very interesting to me when we have um these debates about church leadership um obviously like I, i think i said in the last episode like typically when you interview for church jobs everybody wants to know what you think about uh women pastors and women in leadership um this passage is very straightforward about that, actually, because I I remember uh, in seminary classes, I had a professor that would say, well, if anyone ever asks you if a woman can be a pastor, a leader of God's church, just point out the fact that Paul says um, that an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife. (laughs) And he was like his very pointed opinion and response to those Mm -hmm. questions was, how could a woman be a husband of one wife? Um, wow. which, Today, you just never know. <laughs> uh, which is probably a little bit more pointed than what people Ugh. tend to appreciate. Um, but I think there's a lot more here than can women be pastors. I think there, mm-hmm. there's a lot mm-hmm. more here. And I think sometimes when this passage is sold that way as the, um, I don't know, like women in leadership passage or something, I think it's being undersold. I think so too. Because for me, it's like, okay, that whole conversation aside, it's like, I think sometimes the reason we get frustrated is like there's this idea that any man can be over a woman or something like that. Like any man can do this. But it's like, no, if you actually look at some of these qualifications, there are quite a few men out there who do not meet Mm-hmm. these at all mm-hmm. um so it also is comforting to me knowing that we also have a responsibility to make sure that the men that are chosen to be leading our churches leading our people um leading god's people excuse me like we have a responsibility to make sure that they meet these qualifications mm-hmm. too so i don't know i think it's there's a lot of qualifiers so it's not just like this man eh, you'll do like no yeah. we have to really look into this and see is this person worthy of this call for God's people. Um, Jen Wilkin is um, someone who I appreciate. It, it's actually funny to be reading this passage about um, men being leaders of churches and then me to quote Jen Wilkin. Um, <laughs> she has this opinion called, uh, she calls it like generous complementarianism. And she often talks about the problems of churches that like they just read, they just read man who can be a pastor, any man. Mm-hmm. And that oftentimes is very hurtful, not only to the church, but obviously also to women, because gender is not the requirement for leadership in God's church. Like, that's actually just like a, a tiny little side note. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the much bigger pieces are sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable. I'm reading like right from, what yeah, is this verse? Two, two and three. Yeah. Um, able to teach. I have that one circled. Not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. I have that underlined. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? This is not just any man. I'm number six too. There's like a wisdom piece there as well. Um, not, must not be a recent convert. Yeah. Uh, because you're like very, you're much more susceptible to yes. the devil's schemes uh, if you are not solid or well versed and grown in your faith. You can pick any one of these subpoints and point to many times that this has caused problems 
in the church. Like, for example, just because you're talking about it um, first, <laughs> many, <laughs> many, many it. times the the church as a you know like as a movement or whatever is very excited to take recent converts that are famous and throw them on stage and have them teach stuff and it usually and it's, does not pan out it's well. obvious that they are not mature christian believers they're not strong in their faith they're not able to teach but people can't wait to hear them because they're famous and we as a church as a movement have have made that mistake far too many times mm-hmm. I would say there's also times when um, folks are promoted into pastoral positions and they are clearly not able to teach. Um, you know, like like there's this strange idea, like I would say recently, where if you are a good businessman, yes. then you fit the role of a pastor yes. because you can grow the church, and that is like, oh, that just makes my heart hurt because church is not a business. I mean, there is a piece of like right. wanting to grow your members, but it's not business minded. And I think a lot of times I have I have actually seen and I have known people who have gone into certain roles like that. And it has like not only for the people that they were shepherding, but also for their own families. It was very destructive and it actually like they didn't last long and it, they like ripped themselves out of it pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, it's it says it right here. Like we should pay attention to these things. I was I was actually just uh, met with a pastor today. I had a really really compelling lunch with this uh, local pastor, and he was talking about something he had read recently, where um, uh, like the sort of the 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 main church model that's being used in the United States today um, originated with like Saddleback, Willow Creek, oh, and um, I think Crystal Cathedral, um, where where they essentially like flipped the model and it's like this this giant funnel where it's just get as many people in as you possibly can, uh, get them to pray a prayer, get them to sit in a small group, get some of them discipled, and essentially like it's it's what Jesus did flipped on its head. It's like make the crowds the main focus of your ministry mm-hmm. and hope that like two or three percent end up getting discipled. And what a lot of people misunderstand about what Jesus did is that the crowds were never the focus of his ministry. It was those 12 guys, and even within those 12 guys, those three guys that he was with most of the time and was investing in and discipling and caring for. Um, so uh, his his thing, actually, to your point, Jenny, is that those big churches like Willow Creek, Saddleback, uh, Crystal Cathedral, they actually hired a bunch of um, MBAs from Harvard Business School okay. to run their churches. Mm-hmm. And that's why their churches ended up following like these established business principles, which business principles aren't bad. Like it, it's not a terrible thing to make wise business decisions, but, it, but church is not a business. Like the, the point of church is not to grow your brand. Uh, the point of church is to disciple more people and bring more people to Jesus and help them to know him and follow him. So, um, I guess that was a little bit of a sidetrack, but that conversation I had today was, I guess incredible. like my, my instant thought goes to like, if you're happy, this is like super stupid, but it's like a business minded thing, but also reflective of the church. Like if you have a massive yard sale and like 200 people show up and you make $2, like <laughs> what's the point? Like, yeah, who cares? Like you can tell lots of people, everybody came, but like you didn't, you didn't succeed. I mean, you could put that in any business uh-huh. scenario too, but um, anyway, that is something that was sticking out to me. So just in the interest of highlighting some of these things, not a lover of money. Like it's, it's really difficult when you see some of these guys that live in these enormous mansions and have fleets of cars and fleets of jets. And like, mm-hmm. it, it's not bad to have wealth and resources, please understand me. Um, but it, but it's also not unfair to be like, Hey, like, are you, are you a lover of money? Like, are What's you just accumulating things? Like if you are, if you're preaching the gospel of Christ, that's lay up your treasures in heaven. Like, I don't know, is it, you know, it, it's not wrong to ask some of these questions and it's it's not wrong to evaluate our our pastors and leaders well like this is a um, actually how's the how's the chapter start out um the saying is trustworthy if anyone aspires to the office of overseer which also could be pastor and shepherd he desires a noble task therefore um the overseer must be above reproach that is like you have to have really high character mm-hmm. um and actually one of the things i, I want to point out not only within the church, but outside the church. If you look at verse seven, moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. So that's like, yeah, you need to care well for the church, 
but you also need to care well for your neighbors. I talked to um, a, a pastor once in some of my Bible classes where their church actually interviewed every potential elder. They interviewed every single one of their neighbors because they wanted to know if their neighbors saw these guys as helpful presences in the in yeah. the neighborhood or hurtful, embarrassing people in the neighborhood. And they actually disqualified people over the testimony of their neighbors, um, which mm-hmm. again, seems I mean, like you could receive that as kind of extreme. Um, but that is really taking the time to make sure that you're being led by spiritually mature people. So I love this passage. It's probably obvious. I love this passage, but yeah. Well, I do want to have a clarifying thing here because I don't know that like everybody and myself included, I'm maybe perhaps a little shaky on yeah. this because I grew up in a church where there was like the pastor and then there was like the church board. Yeah. So the next section of this talks specifically about the qualifications of deacons. So originally, I think the first part of the chapter was probably focused more on like actual church leadership, like a pastor, like you were saying. But what would you say separates that first section from the second about deacons? Uh, one one of the clear separating factors is that in this list for deacons is they are not required to teach. So th- they have fairly close requirements. But uh, what would you say a deacon's role would be? What is that? So like? I would say a deacon like helps to support the ministry. Like a lot of times you'll see deacon teams that um, sort of care for the people. Like they, they help to carry the weight of shepherding people. So, I've heard deacon couples as well. Yes. Yeah. A lot of times uh, churches go along with deacon couples, which I don't think is scandalous because the highlight is still on spiritually mm-hmm, mature mm-hmm. men. You can even see in this passage that it talks about the wives the should wife, be sober yeah. minded. Um, so I don't, I don't think that's a crazy decision. Uh, a lot of times deacons are just, um, helping to assist with the work of the ministry. It is clear that elders and overseers are like a little bit more in authority. Um, and deacons are like some other kind of level of care. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but regardless, I guess we did have deacon couples. That's not, yeah, you did. That's not fair. I know that church. We had like a couple of them. I think it was four. I, I also just, um, another interesting thing to point out, like a lot of churches, govern their churches a lot of different ways. Like you had an elder board, which is kind of a blend. Yeah. Um, a lot of churches have just church elders, which I think is actually the best way to go. That That is the biblical model. Um, a lot of churches have now boards that are just full of business guys that make business decisions and help the church make sound uh, business decisions. I don't know that that's a terrible thing, but a lot of times guys aren't chosen for their spiritual maturity. Uh, they're mm-hmm. chosen for their business acumen. So like, and don't, don't hear me wrong. Like I'm not against business guys. Um, but just, just <laughs> it's because, currently your job, <laughs> <laughs> just because you're successful in business doesn't mean you're spiritually mature enough to right, lead God's church. Right. Uh, I mean, you can consult, you can help make good decisions, but not every successful business person is a, should be an elder. Um, and not every elder is going to be a successful business person. So it, there is a little bit of a mess in how we lead our churches today. And I do think that some of it goes back to we're not choosing elders and overseers the way that we should be. Um, another thing one of my professors always pointed out in Bible college was there's not a, uh, a clear number here. So like it, like it doesn't say like every church should have five elders and they should serve a three-year term. And at the end of that three-year term, they can elect somebody else. Like that's not in here. That's not biblical. <laughs> um, because again, that's not choosing people based on their spiritual maturity. Like th- there is no number spelled out. What is spelled out is that you have to be mature and you have to be able to teach and able to care for God's people. And sometimes churches get in trouble because their bylaws say they need they need eight elders, uh, but they don't have eight men that are spiritually mature. And you end up picking somebody just because they're an available man, uh, which is a terrible way to pick a leader. I like how it kind of rounds out this chapter then too. Paul talks about how this this idea of church leadership mirrors very much about what he's been talking about in the past, uh, where the church is like a family. Our Bible mentions that in our notes, that it's like a family. And in so, like there are certain roles and responsibilities, mm-hmm. but it's also worth doing because it protects um, – the task that the church has as well as like protects the gospel as well Mm -hmm. Um, because it doesn't leave room for weird little things to like rear their head up Mm -hmm. that don't belong Mm -hmm. because that's not how it was established or meant to to be so i really like that he kind of adds that little last piece in there as well 
And if you have spiritually mature leaders, they're able to sniff that stuff out. They, they have sound doctrine, like the elders and overseers, they're all able to teach sound doctrine because they understand it and they understand it so well, they can teach it. So that helps them make wise decisions. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, you will find people that try to make a case that like, oh, this is fiercely cultural, like times have changed. Paul was just writing to Timothy in a specific culture and context. What's interesting is that Paul's not teaching Timothy for one specific church. Mm -hmm. Like this is the pastoral handbook that Paul's handing down to Timothy. And this is a broad scope uh, application here. So Paul's saying like, Hey, this is how churches should be led. And these are the kind of people that you should find. And these are the kind of people that you should tap for these kinds of positions. So, um, I, you know, I think as far as your part goes, um, probably not all of us are involved in choosing elders. Probably not all of us are church elders. Um, I, I will kind of bring it down to an everyone level. Like, um, be very careful about your own character. Like, I, like certainly mm -hmm. it doesn't hurt to strive to be like this. Um, it, it certainly doesn't hurt to try to have these kind of qualities so that you can be, um, a wise and useful spiritual mature leader in God's church at some point. And that, that, that applies to men and to women, by the way, like it, it doesn't hurt to be a spiritually mature woman that is going to invest in bringing up other women. Like that's not a bad thing. It's a great thing. Right. Um, so I would say like, like it doesn't hurt to strive to be like this list. Certainly it wouldn't hurt to read over this list and, mm -hmm. and look at things that you're struggling in and Let's try to grow in those things to not be there to be dignified and yeah. not slanderous Yeah, because that is super easy. For us sometimes. <laughs> um, and, and then I would say on top of it too, like if you're, you know, if you're looking for a church, I mean, first and foremost, I would say you should be committed to your church if your church is led by spiritually mature people. Um, but if you're not currently connected somewhere, like look for places that are led by spiritually mature people that fit this context. Um, if your church is being led by people who don't fit this context, that's not a great thing. Um, and you have to decide if you're going to uh, throw in and try to help with that issue, um, help to uh, bring maturity to your church, or you have to decide if you're going to find a place that's being led well, like is being spelled out here. So it's not easy. It's a little bit tricky. Uh, and certainly if you uh, are part of a church that's doing things this way, uh, you already understand that you're probably in the minority. So uh, I do love these chapters. Um, sometimes we can be afraid of these, but I don't think we should be. Thanks for joining us for chapter three. We'll be back again tomorrow with First Timothy chapter four. Hey, before we get into the reading, we want to tell you quickly about Logos Bible Software. It's very helpful to us as we prep for the podcast and we can offer it to you at a discounted rate. There's two links in our description. One will get you the Logos uh, Fundamentals Pack for 50 bucks, which is a great price. The other one will get you a percentage off any package that you want. We use it often. We think it'll be useful to you. And if you use that link, you'll be helping out the podcast. So go check that out with that in mind, here's today's reading. 1 Timothy chapter 3. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, he must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be a husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that, if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, 
vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of God's Plan, Your Part. Don't forget, you can find us on just about every social media platform and YouTube. Let us know what you thought of today's episode, and if you have any questions, go ahead and post them there. You can also reach out to us directly at godsplanyourpart at gmail.com. As always, if you don't have a Bible, or if you'd like to use the one that we use, uh, reach out to us via email, and we'll be happy to send one to you. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you again tomorrow.